good evening. I, I'm Tim O'Shea, Principal and Vice-Chancellor of the University, and it's a tremendous pleasure uh, to welcome you all um, here for the 2016 Tam DL Prize Lecture. And, of course, we're all delighted that Tam himself is here in, in, in the front row uh, joining us for this um, very, very interesting topic. Uh, we've been awarding the Tam DL Prize for excellence in engaging the public with science since 2008, um, it's a prize to recognise and reward the dedication of our academics in communicating the sometimes hard and difficult ideas of science to non-scientists. The university is ob obviously in an immensely strong position with regard to research and with regard to science, uh, ranked uh, top in Scotland, fourth in the UK, and consistently one of the top 25 universities in the world. <coughs> but for us, the, the research recognition is very important, but... Uh, the, the public engagement matters, and the Edinburgh uh, International Science Festival uh, has been absolutely brilliant, and we have been a, a really key participants in that. And I'm really in, indebted to Vice Principal Mary Bounds in particular for the work she has done uh, to ensure uh, that we are engaged. Lots of researchers and postgraduates. We've had family workshops uh, where families together are learning how the brain works. Uh, looking at the role of rainforests in environmental change, exploring the science between the sounds of different musical instruments, and learning about how sunlight helps us. Um, and the, in this hall, we've had something really quite wonderful. Uh, we have had um, an event on the kaleidoscopes. They are 200 years old. Um, they were invented by one of my predecessors, Principal Sir David Brewster. You see them displayed at the end. And normally, after an event like this, you would have something very boring. You'd have like something like a wine and cheese event. After this event, you're going to have a wine and kaleidoscope event. <laughs> also, even though some of the kaleidoscopes are embedded in pineapples and croissants, please don't eat them. But it is, but we will conclude uh, with a wine and kaleidoscope event. So delighted um, that you're here, uh, and I'm now going to pass over to Vice Principal uh, Professor Jane Norman, who's going to chair the lecture. Please. So, so thank you and welcome, everybody. I have the privilege of convening this uh, prize lecture. So, so the university has been awarding the Tam Dial Prize Lecture for excellence in engaging the public in, with science since 2008. And it's the university's annual prize to recognize and reward an outstanding science communicator from our community. Tam Diel is probably best known for being the father of the House of Commons and for his formulation of the West Lothian question. But he's also a staunch advocate and a globally well-recognized science communicator himself. So much so that when he retired after 36 years from writing a weekly column in The New Scientist, The New Scientist made an exception and marked his retirement with an article. In an extract from the article in the New Scientist magazine, they say, the best columnists do not merely present opinions, they provoke, educate, and pursue the truth and challenge authority and orthodoxy. By those standards, Tam Diel has done an exemplary job. Another person who's done an exemplary job, particularly for our community, is Professor, Professor Sethu Vijay Kumar. Sethu joined the university in 2003 and became Professor of Robotics in 2010. He's the director of the Edinburgh Centre for Robotics at the School for Informatics, a centre that's helping the world create the new generation of robots that can see, react, learn, and adapt to the world around us. Sethu leads an inter-university team that's developing intelligent or sensitised robots that can make autonomous decisions themselves and operate in disaster zones where it would be dangerous for human beings to go. For instance, the site of the Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan in 2011. In technical terms, Sethu's work pioneers the use of large-scale machine learning techniques in real-time control with large degree of freedom anthropomorphic robotic systems. To the rest of us, this means he pioneered the use of the Honda Asimo humanoid robots, a robot arm and a prosthetic hand, and I think we'll see some of those today, hopefully. Sethu's latest project involves collaboration with NASA's Johnson Space Center on the Valkyrie human robot, uh, which will ultimately be going to Mars. Seth is also a recent judge on the BBC series of Robot Wars, which has about 2 million viewers and is seen in 26 countries all over the world. So Seth will no doubt become Edinburgh's newest celebrity professor. 
Seth, who's a, a multi-award winner, having won the IEE Vincent Bendix Award and others, this new award, the Tam Diel Prize, is now confirmation of Sethu's enthusiasm to be a good science communicator. He's been active in conceptualizing, producing, and presenting several public outreach events to engage with the general public, both adults and children, on all things science and engineering. I'm very proud to ask Professor Sethu Vijay Kumar to present the 2016 Tam Diel Prize lecture, Sharing Autonomy and Responsibility, The Robots Are Ready, Are You? Thank you. Thank you, Jane, and um, it's indeed my honor and uh, privilege to be presenting the uh, 2016 Tam Dial uh, Prize Lecture, and uh, if you think my surname is hard to read, I've been practicing last night how to say Tam Diel. Uh, <coughs> um, and again, uh, thank you all for uh, giving up your Sunday evening and uh, coming um, to look at this uh, lecture. I hope you're not disappointed. Uh, we have a lineup of a few, besides the lecture, we have a lineup of a few exciting live demos involving strapping people to um, pretty uh, powerful motors, including putting an 11-year-old in a little uh, prosthetic hand and also trying to control a 120-kilogram rather complex piece of equipment halfway across the town. So hopefully you will not be disappointed. Um, so actually, I realized I forgot my clicker. Yeah, it's here. OK, good. Um, so before I start talking about the, uh, the, the key elements of the lecture, I want to start by thanking uh, a lot of the people behind the scenes who've been responsible for all the work. Um, my group, the Edinburgh Center for Robotics, um, and a bunch of wonderful people, faculty, staff, students, uh, too many to name here, but these are the current set of people who work with me, um, including a couple of faculty members who've been very supportive with this. So all the work that you're going to see here is a combination of stuff that comes out of this whole group. Um, so to, to think about where robots are going next, um, traditionally, robots have been operated using a mode called teleoperation, which involves basically a, a person pretty much puppeteering a robot and the robot mimicking it, uh, its motion in, in very um, sort of um, repeatable fashion. So the technology of today and the research of today is going towards creating more autonomy in robotic platforms. In other words, creating systems that can make decisions on its own, uh, creating systems that can actually um, you know, uh, work pretty much independently of human supervision. Uh, and this is not a new endeavor. Actually, um, nostalgic memories of Sarkos humanoid robot in 1996. This was, I was a naive master student at that point in Japan, said, I'm going to change the world. Uh, I became very good at using the mop and the bucket, because every time we run an experiment, there was a big pool of hydraulic fluid at the end of the, at the, at the bottom of the uh, robot. But uh, this was, traditionally, this robot was used as a um, demonstration for Ford motor car shows, and somebody would puppeteer the robot, um, and we made our first attempts at applying machine learning, um, autonomous learning systems, to actually try and get autonomy into the robotic platforms. So uh, it is an ongoing, um, very interesting journey from my perspective. Um, so, but compared to these two extremes of operation, what my honest belief is that what we're going to see in the next 10 to 15 years, and perhaps a more interesting and more complex, uh, but perhaps more um, rewarding uh, endeavor is to see something called shared autonomy. So something which basically devolves significant elements of the control to the robot, but still has humans in the loop. So to basically explain uh, the concept of shared autonomy, I'm going to start with my first live demo. I'm going to ask the help of Maithli, my daughter, my 11-year-old, to come up. 
and Deepti is going to help me with that. Um, so maybe I can ask a volunteer from the crowd, anybody wanting to try and put a, an EMG sensor on their hand? Any, any volunteers, any brave souls here? Otherwise, I'm going to have to do it myself. OK, so in that case, let me start. Uh, let me do that myself. OK, so, so this is, uh, Matthew, you want to move a bit closer here? OK. Um, I think the live feed is here. Otherwise, I'll be in the middle of the live feed. I think that's, that's the idea. So, um, so the EMG sensors here actually measure the muscle activity on my um, hands. And this prosthetic sensor that Maitley is wearing is actually a, a product that um, is, a, is a result of a spin-off from the university and the NHS um, on restoring limbs. For, so for example, if you've had a, an accident or if you're born with a congenital uh, problem, then this prosthetic device would restore some of the sensory uh, and motor capabilities of the person wearing this. So what I'm going to try and do next is to actually move this prosthetic hand using the EMG sensors on my, um, uh, on my hand. And let's see if I can manage to turn it on. And you can see here that Yeah, so when I open and close my hand, um, the prosthetic response. So basically, the one extreme of doing full autonomy would be that the, the hand basically reacts on its own, and it sees an object, it grasps it on its own. The other teleoperation extreme would be that it decodes every aspect of my finger movements and literally mimics that on the, on the prosthetic hand. But this is something in between where the volition of opening and closing actually comes from me, but a lot of the smarts are built into the hand. So Deep, if you can go turn around here and put the, um, the, the bottle in front of the grasp of the, uh, the hand, and I'm going to actually turn away. So, and you can see that even without looking at, sorry, even without looking at the hand, I'm able to control it because the decision on when the hand should stop closing is made by the hand on its own. Um, and you want to grasp it? And you can actually use this to, for example, grasp a ball. Again, I'm going to turn away. And you can see that the, the hand decides on its own when to stop closing. So this is a very good example of shared autonomy where the humans are still in the loop, the volition of what, um, whether to open and close, when to do it, and how to do it comes from the human, but the smarts um, are in the, in the actual prosthetic hand. So, so thank you to my two able helpers. Thank you very much for that. Take it with you. OK, so moving right along. Um, so what we want to, so this, this concept of shared autonomy has been talked about in different domains, um, uh, ranging from um, you know, um, autonomous vehicles to um, things like um, the surgery, so robotic surgery, where a surgeon is uh, operating on a patient but is assisted by, um, by, by robotic platforms. So, there's a recent book by a professor from MIT called David Mindel, which said that full autonomy is actually a 20th century rhetoric. The real frontier is when we have the ability to control the different levels of, an, of autonomy at different moments. And effectively, such a system should be able to reduce human workload and fatigue. Um, but the human still feels in the control of, of the overall goal. So um, robots are ubiquitous now. They have um, shown up in domains ranging from self-driving cars to prosthetics, as you've seen an example, some underwater field robots to medical robots, all the way from co-manufacturing and um, an industrial setting. Um, the problem for full autonomy is that there are many hard problems in science to solve. So we have noisy sensing in the system. It needs to interact with many multiple objects. Um, and we need guarantees for safe operation if we are ever able to accept this uh, kind of mode in our everyday life. 
So what I'm going to do next in the sort of 15 to 20 minutes is to give you a run through of the scientific elements that we've been working on to try and make some of these hard problems go away. So looking at concepts in sensing, in actuation, in safe operations, how can we do that effectively? So let me start by looking at the problem of understanding and representing the world around you. You and me do it very well. It's very easy, but it's quite hard for a robot to do that. So the first thing to do is obviously you want to track and localize um, an object around you. So here's some research that's again come out of our lab, uh, which is dealing with the problem of moving a robot arm in response to something that moves dynamically in the environment. So this is what sometimes people call visual tracking or visual servoing. And what this program is doing is it's in real time tracking the position of various elements of interest, the cup, the hand, the bottle, um, and it's basically a reacting to hard problems like when it gets outside the depth camera range, and in a moment you will see a scenario where the camera itself moves. So this is a case where you can see it's a static camera at the moment, but if you equip a robot with sensors, you can't expect the robot to be stationary, so it will move. So we have to do the same thing while the camera moves around. So this is a hard problem in computer vision, in computer track, in, in, in tracking of objects, and this is something that we've managed to do using fairly high compute power, very high GPU clusters, uh, so high uh, compute power that is available to us. So there are still some limitations in terms of embedding them into autonomous systems. But you can see here examples of how we can do this tracking very efficiently. Um, so that's um, great. Um, and such systems, you can think about applications ranging from things like uh, when a person is bedridden and you want a robot helper to help the person to feed or get the person some um, something from somewhere else in the room, uh, a, 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 a sort of capability like tracking a person's hand and an object um, is, is, can be quite useful. So that was about creating um, a unified percept in terms of um, tracking. But if you now want to really understand what's going on around the environment around you, you don't, it's not just about tracking objects, but actually creating a cohesive percept of the world around you. So uh, Maurice Fallon, who's one of the faculties uh, who've joined us from MIT, has been working on this problem of dense mapping for locomotion. Um, his work involves taking raw sensors like cameras, lidars, and creating uh, a map of the world, not just creating a static map of the world, but actually taking that and converting it into things that can be used for control. So you saw the visual surveying example. Now if you blow that complexity up 10 times and try to basically do that on a real robotic platform like this, a humanoid robot platform like this. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been, so this is a collaboration with MIT. Uh, this was originally on the DRC, the Delphi Robotics Challenge, and we are now extending this capability on our new robot, which I'll talk about in a moment. And this is what the robot sees. Um, so that's the vision, the camera. Um, that's what's happening with the robot going across this cinder block. And that's the real-time motion planning while it's creating a sense of the local sense of the environment uh, around the world. So believe me, it's much harder for the robot to fall than make it uh, walk so precisely. So what are the essential elements that's required to, to do that? Um, it involves various small steps. So things like creating um, a, a return in terms of the different um, you know, um, maps of the world, um, creating footsteps to ensure that stability is maintained um, using classical or advanced machine learning algorithms for doing things like terrain segmentation to figure out what is the um, state of the, uh, the footstep where it can place affordable uh, so affordances. Um, and finally, 
you know, generating this whole map um, and doing real-time control on it. So that was about sensing. Um, robots and humans typically speak different languages. Um, what I mean by that is you and me, when you give an instruction to say that put this on the table, you don't precisely say put this on position X, Y, and Z. You say put it on the table or under the table or uh, wrap something around it. So indeed, we need to worry about bridging representations. Um, and we have made some attempts at creating appropriate representations that can nicely um, go between nice intuitive human uh, interpretations versus things that need to be executed on the robot. So it is not purely for the understanding aspect, a significant element of programming with these robots, programming in these what we call topological spaces, simplify the bigger problem of matching what is required and what is the next step to take. So let me start by giving you a quick example. So if you want to if you want a robot arm to reach inside a box, you can specify that in n number of ways. You can say you reach into it by specifying position x, y, and z. But if you use some topological structures to define what is inside and outside, the advantage is that when the box moves, the concept of what is inside and outside moves with the box. And then you don't have to explicitly replan movements but rather just execute the same plan under a slightly different modified topological structure. So here, for example, this is explicit collision avoidance without really doing the kind of classical potential field-based methods because you can exploit the topology that comes out of the structure to then define what is a goodness criterion and you can generalize much more efficiently over different movements. And this we have done for various things, ranging from you know, uh, soft and dynamic objects, articulated and flexible objects, and how to do that very efficiently. OK, and where can this be applied? So we've been working with a company called OC Robotics um, for robots in confined spaces. And this is a video of that robot arm. And traditional planning with these very high dimensional snake-like robots are very hard if you don't work in the right space. So topological metrics, topological ways of measuring movements and relational structures are very important to, to make such complex robots work in um, uh, complicated spaces. So you'll see in a moment the robot, um, this, these are specifically meant for working in dangerous environments. So. Um, for confined spaces, things like the nuclear industry, uh, how we can do decommissioning in those kind of situations where people can, can be harmed. So these are examples of robots going in confined spaces, um, getting access to places where you would have to potentially dismantle things before getting in there and, and doing repair. So, so repair um, in hazardous environments. So. Um, so that's, you get the general idea. So planning in those kind of robotic platforms is quite hard if you don't consider these kind of um, you know, uh, difference in languages, so to say. So um, in spite of working with very good sensors and having these nice um, uh, you know, representations, you still have uncertainty in the world. Your sensor um, still has noise. Your world is uncertain. So there needs to be some way of dealing with uh, different kinds of safety. So remember, one of the bullet points was we need to ensure safety uh, in getting robots to interact with, with people. So one way of doing that is, simply speaking, attaching an end effector with a motor, but put a spring in between it. If you put a spring in between it, then it becomes what we call compliant. So in layman terms, it becomes soft. So creating Machines like that are hard. Even harder is how to control these kind of systems. So we're at the University of Edinburgh. Our group has been world leaders in creating algorithms for control of um, compliant actuating, actuation systems. So, um, and this becomes even more important when you have robots that people need to wear. 
because compliance, if, you have, if you've got a robot having a mind of its own and the person wearing it trying to do something else, that can be pretty dangerous. So shared autonomy to the max, you know. Um, and here you can see an example of an exoskeleton that is built by a company called Cyberdyne. Uh, we have a version that we've been collaborating with with the company in Pisa, and you will see in a moment uh, that being demonstrated live by Graham. But before I do that, I want to show you an example of combining the sensing and the different representations and getting a robot to, for example, co-work while a person is in the loop. So here's an example of Vlad, um, our postdoc, interacting with the robot while the robot is still doing the task that I showed you right at the beginning. Um, so if you want to move robots from sort of confined spaces to places where you work with them, you need application domains and algorithms that are able to do this. Um, robots that do its primary task while avoiding uh, people and objects and uh, do that in a safe and compliant fashion. And, and that, is, that is the crux of uh, one of the key aims of shared autonomy, uh, where robots and humans can still work together. So um, one of the things that we've been looking to do is to go beyond pre-programmed behavior. So humans, you and me, do some of the things like learning a new task very well. So we are able to predict consequences of, of some action, and we're able to predict task goals and intentions. So there's a similar thing that we need to do to make robots a lot more adaptive. And one of the things that we've been looking at, and this is work from almost um, the time of my PhD, um, is getting robots to learn on its own. So just like a baby moves its arms around, uh, the robot moves its arms around, figures out the consequence of its action, on, in this case, trying to learn the relationship between the forces that a robot applies and the, in this case, the fingertip movement. And once you do that, then you can um, do advanced things like, in this case, do a fancy thing of trying to learn the task dynamics of this pole and learn to balance this pole. It might seem like a trivial thing to do, but if you invert that pole, that is exactly the problem that we are trying to do when you try to get a robot um, a humanoid robot to walk, the inverted pendulum problem, right? So in this case, you can see the robot learns from trial and error the value of different actions, and from that, it figures out what is the appropriate set of actions to take at particular instances to, in this case, keep the, the pole upright, okay? So, um, it's not enough if we just have, this is my only math slide, by the way. So yeah, um, so um, it's not enough if you just have some intentions and some, um, some sensing, but you need to actually take the objective function and literally plan with it. You need to plan with these different observation scales, different abstractions, and one way we do that is by what we call planning by inference. So those of you who understand Bayesian computations, so we essentially take Bayesian inference and apply it to the problem of inferring the next best state to go to to achieve certain tasks and objectives. And again, uh, if you do that, you can get robots to do something like that. So here's an example of a bipedal robot. Uh, this is um, work by one of my PhD students have just graduated, Alexander Enoch, uh, and this is the world's first bipedal robot that has the ability to change the damping and stiffness of every joint. And you might ask, why is that important? It's because when you and me walk on different terrains, when we walk on grass, when we walk on, on hard ground, we automatically change the stiffness properties of our, our knees, um, our joints, so that we are stable, we are energy efficient, and we are able to adapt to different terrains. So this is our attempt to doing that. And the advantage of that is prosthesis, so sort of active prosthesis, active pelvis orthosis, active ankle orthosis, active um, um, you know, lower limb um, prosthesis can actually benefit from the ability to modulate stiffness and you make it much more stable. So what we're gonna do is, is to show you a live demonstration of 
pelvis or an active pelvis orthosis, and Graham's going to actually come up and um, show you this live demo. So what he's wearing uh, is, if you can switch the, the yeah, great, thank you. So uh, maybe Graham, if you just stand up here for a moment, um, just to give people an idea of what he's wearing. So he, this is an active pelvis orthosis, which means um, it is a device, uh, maybe if you can also just turn sideways, it's a device which has got um, motors at the hip and it can apply torques to, the, um, to the, the two legs and it's got a passive joint um, on its uh, in between. So the whole idea is if you have a person who has a problem with either a stroke or some sort of, you know, I've had a ACL replacement playing my footy and on the way to recovery. Um, if you have an ability to apply torques and forces to rehabilitate a person um, while the person is recovering, or in this, of course, in the case of a paraplegic patient, support him, then that is what we really want to do. And this is an example of a device which is going towards doing that. So what you see actually on the screen here is the different torques that the different joints are, are actually applying. And now um, Graham is going to actually walk down the aisle, aisle and um, you can see that the, the motors now, it is in transparent mode, which means that it is actually a, able to, now you can see that the two um, actuators are now in sync with Graham, I think you need to come back because the, the Wi-Fi is, uh, oh dear, okay. Should we, should we try and, yeah, okay, good. So, uh, so I think that's, so, so basically you can still have some problems with the Wi-Fi. So, so it's, it's now synced with his, um, with his motion and it's still in transparent mode, which means that at the moment, Graham shouldn't be experiencing any force. And soon we're going to turn on support or assistance and Wolfgang, maybe you can go for it. And as soon as he does that, he gets a 15 Newton meter torque on his legs. It's very hard for you to feel what he's feeling right now, but maybe after the lecture you can have a go at this. But what it's doing is it's applying a force um, of 50 Newton meter on, an, on his legs. And effectively, if he were to walk on a treadmill or go up a slope, he would find it much easier to do that. Um, so this is an example of an autonomous pelvis orthosis applying torques and forces to, to really, um, you know, um, the, the sky's the limit what you can do with it. Um, so this is, um, again, medically approved, and it's a device that we are testing. We've got some facilities in our, um, in our lab with split treadmill facilities, so we're doing all sorts of experiments at the moment still with healthy patients, healthy people, um, uh, about sort of how they, how they recover from stumble when you get a perturbation, et cetera. So, so thank you, Graham, uh, and we'll, you can have a go at this, uh, at least, uh, you know, try experience the forces that it's, it's able to generate after the lecture. Okay, if we can switch back to that, yeah, thank you. Um, so, indeed, adaptation is at the, um, at the core of all of these uh, problems, uh, and we, we have a huge uh, amount of work that we put into getting robots that are able to adapt, change its behavior based on novel situations, and essentially, change, um, you know, uh, for example, if Graham were to carry uh, a, a load, um, can the robot automatically figure out what are the changes in forces that it needs to apply such that he gets the same level of assistance? From a mechanical point of view, that's two different things. You know, you have this additional load. Can it detect itself? There's a new load. There's something systematic, not perturbation. And can you change that while it's while it's happening? So that's we are we aren't there yet, but that's where we are going with this with this work. Okay, so um, that was the core science. Now I want to show you some domains of application where we've been taking the science and and applying um, this. There's a couple of interesting projects. So you saw already the human support robot. So we are not directly involved with this project, but this is an example. And there's some Google self-driving cars. Um, you've seen 
um, some autonomous navigation that go goes on there. But what I really want to focus on is the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which is a challenge that was um, held about a year back uh, in the US. Um, and it was, a, it, was about, it was a challenge about humanoid robots um, doing an obstacle course. So it had to get on a, on a little uh, golf cart, dismount, open a door, uh, walk to a wall, um, do an operation in terms of cutting a, a hole, um, take a hose and, and uh, sort of connect it, walk up a stair, m sort of go through debris, things like that. So um, there were quite a few problems with robots, but there were quite a few amazing success stories. So it really pushed people's limits in terms of where we are really going with this. Um, and we, there were some very good examples of amazing science that's coming through and pushing the limits of, of technology. So if you remember, maybe 10 years back, that's when DARPA did the autonomous driving uh, challenge. And now you can see where autonomous driving is. So every day you get things in the news about you know, where we are uh, with, with getting robots to, uh, cars to drive autonomously, navigate autonomously. So, so this was the behind the scenes scenario of the DRC challenge. So uh, we had some involvement with it through the Hong Kong team and Morris directly was part of the MIT's uh, perception lead there. And um, what's next? The next big project that we're involved in is um, something more exciting, something more up in the sky, literally. Um, it's about the NASA Space Robotics Challenge. So we are not directly uh, competing in that, uh, but we have one of the Valkyrie robots. Um, the Na so NASA's vision is for robots to help astronauts in, for example, the ISS. Why? Because you, it wants robots to do um, dangerous things like spacewalks. So you saw about a couple of months back, there was a spacewalk and there was water in the uh, visor in, in the sort of, um, of, of one of the astronauts and they had to cut short the, the walk. And it is still a dangerous job to do in spite of all this quality control. But even more exciting, so Rob Ambrose um, mentioned a uh, goal of getting robots to pre-deploy things on Mars. So sending a mission to Mars, um, an unmanned robotic mission to Mars to pre-deploy um, habitats for a, ma a mission, um, a manned mission much later on. So that's a dream, that's a, a vision, uh, but what do we need to make something like that happen? So we have an exciting collaboration with NASA on the Valkyrie humanoid platform. So we've, been, we've just got delivery of the robot about three, four weeks back. Um, it's an exciting time for us, and we are also pushing ourselves to be the UK hub for the humanoid research, um, in addition to contributing to the Space Robotics Challenge. But what I'm going to do now is to do the exciting part of trying to do something like Houston to Space Station or ISS, right? So we're going to actually uh, get a robot, uh, we're going to try and get um, a robot moving halfway across town in the informatics forum by commands that we're going to send from here. So if we can switch the screen to the live uh, demo. Um, so um, actually, uh, Wolfgang, do you have, maybe to the other screen, is that? Yeah, no, okay. the other one. Is yours connected to there? So there should be one more screen. Okay, good, sorry. So, so, so one of the things that we're going to show you is the interface and the, the robot. And um, at the end of the demo, we'll have a little bit of an audience participation. Okay, but I'm going to hand over to Maurice, who's going to explain a little bit about the robot itself, and hopefully um, things will go without hitch. Over to you, Maurice. <laughs> Hi there. Um, um, can you hear us, uh, Wolf and um, Satu? Yes, I can hear you. Hi. So um, um, you may not be able to see me, but I'm just standing off camera. And um, my name is uh, Dr. Morris Fallon, and uh, we have a small team here in the Informatics Forum, which is about a mile from where you are now. And here you can see, obviously, it's um, the Valkyrie robot, which was delivered one month ago 
from NASA. I'm going to quickly overview the sensors and the components that are on the robot before uh, uh, Wolfgang, who's working there with, with Setu, will give a, a short demo. So I'm going to, using my um, lecture stick, I'm going to um, point to each of the sensors. So on the top of the robot is a stereo camera system. So it's two cameras that gives uh, the equivalent of human binocular vision to the robot. So they're spaced at the same separation as um, the sensors on, are the, the eyes of a person, and it gives an estimate of depth. Here we have a spinning laser. It's um, a, a, a light sensing device, but it actually it's, it, it transmits artificial light, and it, it allows the robot to predict or to create a 3D model of the area around it. So all of the structure of the building that we're, the room we're standing in, the robot can build a 3D model of that and use that to, to make decisions about actions. There is a series of cameras in the chest, and while we're not using the hands today, um, there are cameras and touch sensors in the hands. Here in the, in the robot's pelvis, in the back of the pelvis, is a motion sensor called an IMU. Um, earlier in the demonstrations that Setu was running through, um, on the prosthetic hand there are accelerometers, so the same kind of um, motion sensing devices that are in the robot's pelvis. And they're used to estimate how the robot's moving and to give it an idea about, about its velocity that it uses within its control algorithms. To be able to balance, it, the robot obviously needs to be able to understand how it's moving, but it also needs to be able to understand how it's making contact with the world. And to do that, in every one of the joints, here in the knee, in the elbow, three in the shoulder, they have these series elastic actuators, which uh, Setu mentioned earlier, and they allow the robot to sense the force that's I impacting with, with the world. Obviously, the robot here is operating under a hoist. We're going to give a short demo of um, the robot being commanded through uh, the internet via the latencies that you would expect over the internet. But it's the same kind of technology that has been developed as part of the DARPA Robotics Challenge so that the robot could be operated from the other side um, of the solar system or uh, it's for some of the, the demonstrations that we're interested in, in disaster relief. So I'm going to hand back to uh, Wolfgang and Setu in the the theater, and uh, we'll carry out a short demonstration. OK, great. Uh, thanks, Maurice. And that's uh, Maurice Fallon. Um, he's uh, one of the new lecturers. And uh, I think Simona and Vlad and the rest of the gang there. Um, so, uh, so the really interesting part is this. We can basically, so, so this is a user interface which can basically, um, so Wolfgang can give some high-level commands in terms of uh, the volition, the same story of the shared control team. Um, saying, OK, do you want this kind of high-level goal to happen? And a lot of the other elements of the autonomy in terms of the balance, the control, the, the actual motion planning happens on board the, the robot. So, so what we're going to do is now to get the audience to decide whether you want the robot to raise its left arm or the right arm. Okay? As, and then we're going to get that command through uh, through Wolfgang, and hopefully we'll see the robot move uh, across the across town. Okay, so how many of you want the right arm to go up? Okay, okay. How many of you want the left arm to go up? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I think I think the left one there. So um, I think we're going to go with left. Okay. So 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 basically. Wolfgang has commanded the, the left arm to, to move. And with the kind of delays that we, oh, there you go. OK. OK. So, so you can, so the, the whole idea behind this kind of you know, remote autonomy is that still you can give some sort of high level goals um, transmitted through the latency and the delays that's typical in these kind of uh, operation scenarios. and get uh, the robot to, to react. Um, so yeah, so thank you. Thank you, guys. And uh, yeah, uh, well done. OK, great. Let's uh, switch back to the, the other presentation mode. OK, thank you. So um, where are we going with this? So that was just a small, quick demo to show you that we can remotely operate a robot um, with the kind of scenarios that we are envisaging on um, for applications for NASA, for example. But in general, our research work is not limited to the kind of work that um, is necessary for 
the Mars mission, for example. So we, we are interested in developing balance, control, manipulation capabilities, full body motion capabilities um, on a platform like this. So for example, this is a, a screen capture of a, of a real time um, footstep placement and manipulation and control algorithm on the, on the Valkyrie that our team has been working on and developing. And um, we, we had that going till we had a sensor failure on the foot. That's why we can't show you the robot actually walking at the moment. Um, but the fundamental capabilities in terms of the control, the planning, the real-time execution of um, being able to react to situations is, is there. So that is what our work has been um, trying to put onto these robotic platforms. So, um, so I'm going to slightly switch gear and for the last sort of five to 10 minutes to talk a little bit about uh, not the technological challenges but the societal impacts and implications that robotics would have um, and we, things that we should be aware of and should uh, you know, think about when we talk about developing new technology. But before that, I just wanted to show you two interesting videos, two amazing videos of not robots, but people. Because um, from these videos, you will actually see that our body is an amazing machine. Okay, let's start with somebody you probably all recognize. To be honest, that is really what we're asking our robots to do, the kind of precision, the kind of thing. And so it's no wonder it's such a hard task. And uh, one more quick video from Closer to Home. Perception, obstacle avoidance, uh, flexible, dexterous manipulation. And he's not even looking. The only time he needs to look is when uh, he needs to figure out whether it's the plate full or not. So, so, so that's the kind of stuff that we're against, right? Uh, humans, as, as a massive, uh, it's the, 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 the limits are up there. Okay, so I'm going to conclude in about five minutes. Uh, sorry for running um, uh, that, for that long, but uh, I think there are some issues that we need to worry about when we talk about uh, robotics and where it's going in terms of where we're going to, how we're going to live with the ro robotic um, technologies. So one of the things that we need to worry about is security. So there have been some interesting examples of um, robots being hacked. Um, it's as susceptible to any of your other mobile devices. So I think that is something that we need to care about and, um, and really uh, make sure things um, are taken care of. Um, so we have a big program in computer security at the uh, School of Informatics in the University of Edinburgh, and I hope we can able to collaborate and you know, develop some of these technologies. But fundamentally, the question we're asking is, when something goes wrong, who's responsible? How do we deal with insurance claims? So these are the interesting questions that we need to address now and ask and answer, try and answer. Ethics. Um, when a, a car is an autonomous driving car um, has a particular behavior programmed into it, must it make a moral decision? So a car is driving down a narrow seat with, street with parked cars, suddenly an unseen pedestrian steps in its, in, in its path, what should the car do? Now, if you give it some more information, if I give you a bit more information and say, uh, the car has five passengers, the pedestrian who steps in front of it is a young child, Veering to the right to miss the child will hit the wall and possibly injure or kill the passenger. What should the car do? So these are all interesting questions that you need to address and come up with, um, with, with answers to. Um, I'm not an expert in this domain, but I think uh, there are now lots of people starting to think about these kind of issues, and it's important we do that. Um, last bit, jobs and skills. So a few months ago, uh, BBC had a program on uh, AI and its impact on our lives and jobs. And it said, you know, you want to retrain people for more comfortable jobs, giving them more leisure, more family time. And I think there are some implications to that as well. Um, and there are very good examples of where 
robots are already doing a great job. Okay, great. So I think the, the, the job spit is very important because I think we need to have a social think about what jobs are things that we'd rather get robots to do because they're boring, dirty, dangerous. There are other bits where we think, you know, we need to have a co-working scenario. And, um, and one of the agenda in relation to jobs and skills is training of the new generation. And I'm not sure how many of you have heard. I'm sure there are a few kids in the, in the audience here. But um, we've been involved with the launch of the BBC Microbit. It's a, it's a device that is, it's, it's actually 20 years since BBC Micro uh, was released as an educational tool. And BBC Microbit um, is the thing since that. Uh, it's, it's every year seven student will get this for free. It's got a processor on board, an accelerometer, some pins. And you can basically use it to create inputs from your sensors, um, use it to control devices, create art forms, designs. The expect in terms of what you can do with it, it is amazing. So my little girls have had a go at uh, trying some of these things um, themselves. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I hope I've given you an idea of the kind of challenges that happen in the domain of robotics and our efforts at dealing with some of them. Um, I hope you appreciate some of the still remaining challenges because that's what we are working on. Um, and if any of you are keen on taking this to the next level, and some of you want to do a PhD in robotics, that's the place that you want to come to. So we have a, a facility, um, a UK-wide facility, a national UK facility, a center of excellence in robotics um, at the University of Edinburgh, um, the Edinburgh Center for Robotics, in collaboration with Harriet Watt, uh, with amazing platforms. Um, this is training um, about an 80 PhD students in the next five to six years in these domains. So filling the skills gap um, some of the students, bright students you see here, are the result of these operations, of, of these, um, these funding, EPSOC um, um, uh, funding um, is, is behind all of this. Um, and I have to, all these toys are really expensive. So uh, I have to thank all my sponsors. So these are the bunch of uh, sponsor um, institutes and research agencies and um, uh, a lot of support from the School of Informatics for my research, and I, I'm hugely indebted to all of them for uh, making this happen. And really, it's, it's been a, uh, a vision for me to uh, take some of this work and make a difference. And I think um, without the help of all of these people, it'll be very hard. Um, I want to stop by putting up this um, um, slide. We tend to overestimate technology in the short term, and that was me 10, 15 years ago going as a master's student and say, I'm going to solve the world. Um, a lot of journalists say, you know, why is, you know, things, uh, the, the robots should have done things 10 years ago. We underestimate the, the complexity of some of these things. At the same time, we underestimate the technology in the long term, so we need to think about the effects that the robots will have in our society and plan for this, whether be it jobs, ethics, um, security. And I think that is, that is very, very important to, uh, it, it's, a, it's a very relevant quote uh, in the context of robotics just now. Okay, thank you very much. And I hope um, you enjoyed the talk. Thank you for a wonderful talk. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. If you would like to ask Seth for something, put up your hand. Lorna's going to come round with the mic. Lorna's at the back. So, um, so I'm happy to step up here. I'll maybe just start and, and ask you, Seth, how quickly do you think this technology will be? You, you talked about the industrial applications and you talked about some medical applications. How quickly do you think we'll get, we'll get to the stage where we have a robot in our homes or where we have a mobile phone? Yeah, I think um, uh, robots in our homes. Um, the form factor in which we see robots um, 
what we think of robots mm. uh, is probably something that is a bit of a myth in terms of saying, you know, only if it looks like a humanoid or only if it looks like a robot on wheels, is it's a real robot. So what I expect is that we will see the technology that comes out of robotics uh, take various different forms. So things just like we've got our mobile phones and devices, so you may have a device which is assisting you in various ways, you know, uh, helping you support your, your sort of when you're lifting something or um, prevent uh, some sort of injury. Um, if you are taking care of an infirm, sort of be an exoskeleton to help you. So the form factor will be varied, but you already see robots now coming into play in many of these situations. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't think it's a question of, of when and how, it's a question of what form factor it takes. Um, so I think, um, and also the other thing is, especially with things like the BBC Microbit, the imagination of the public and the users are the limit in terms of how we use it. So what we are getting towards is, is technology that is accessible to the masses, but at the same time, uh, it is easier to deal with. So robotics used to be um, a domain where only specialists could work with. Mm. Computers was, was like that 20 mm. years ago. Mm. Now we are mass users of computer systems, and that's where we're going. Okay. So um, 20 years ago, a computer became world chess champion. A month ago, uh, Go, very demanding game. How long for Wimbledon? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so Daniel Wolpert, actually, a professor at Cambridge, um, had a very famous quote, and he uses it in most of his talks. It says, there's a, there's a very famous um, sea, sea animal, sea ur sea, I think it's a sea urchin or sea animal. Um, uh, so he, he was making a case that movement is a very hard thing to do, and we use a significant part of our brain to make movements because, and he gives this example, and he says, the sea urchin actually, it actually moves around all its life, it reproduces, and then it attaches itself to a, a rock and, or a coral, and that's what it does for the rest of its life. And the first thing it does is it eats its brain. So it's a little bit like the tenure track position in, 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 <laughs> in, in the sort of, uh, but, but, but I think movement is hugely complicated and hugely difficult. So go, chess, these are examples of things where it's about creating, you know, uh, it's about the state of the system, figuring out what is the next best move to do. But if you now get a robot to actually move, take a piece, uh, take the go piece and place it in the right place, that is quite a hard problem to do. So I think um, movement still remains a big challenge, and that's where um, it will be, I think. Great. Question at the back there. Hi, hi, Stacey. Yeah, I, hi. I, yeah. Ten days ago, I had the privilege of chairing a session at the Science Festival uh, by Lord Rees, Martin yeah. Rees, astronomer royal and former president of the Royal Society. So he's the real deal. Um, and he, um, I don't know if you know his argument, but he says that the human race might not make it through this century. He says it's a 50-50 chance. But he does think intelligent life will continue and that will be robotic life. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think I, I get asked this, um, this kind of uh, doomsday question all the time. And, and I think, um, uh, just as I mentioned towards the end of my sort of lecture, I just kind of alluded to it, there are some aspects of, um, of security, some aspects of, um, you know, these days you, you easily, you buy a ticket and get on a plane without really understanding what goes underneath the hood uh, or what are the electronics uh, or the avionics. So you trust your aircraft to take you where it is. Of course, there's a lot, there's this team underneath it who's, who's trying to figure out uh, that or trying to ensure that it's maintained well and sort of uh, all that kind of thing. So you, you, there's a level of trust that you um, build up, built up. And then, but the moment you start creating more and more complex systems, the problem is going to be that if something goes wrong, it's very hard to trace back the causality of that fault. And that is where I think the danger lies in. So it's less that the robot's going to, you know, do the kind of Shakespearean thing about you know, murdering people and uh, take over the world and chop. Uh, it's, it's more about uh, how much we trust these systems, how can you build trusted systems, and how can we manage complexity to the extent that if something goes wrong, we have an idea 
to where to look at. And so that is my view of things. Um, there are, there's obviously, there's another camp, um, there's been this big debate with Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawkins and um, self-replicating machines. So I think, I think uh, uh, it's, it's hard for me to stand here and say, you know, oh, don't worry, nothing's gonna happen. But I think there is some pragmatic view of things and as of now, which says that it's still hard for robots to move reliably, climb a step, uh, believe me, uh, we've had a really hard time getting robots to balance. Um, on the other hand, I think uh, there are very smart technologies which are able to predict your next move. What you, it can tell you what you're going to buy next before you know it. So I think, I think that is, that is the, the, the challenge. And I don't have a definitive answer to your, your question, though. It's OK. We had one more question here. Thank you. Um, question is about the, the robots and the model of the robots are, are very humanoid. Uh, is that because the, hum the humanoid model is an optimal shape or are we kind of subconsciously following science fiction and sort of trying to achieve th things from, from sci-fi? Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, I think I, I dug up Mike's uh, quote or some email uh, to me about a year or two years back about the nature being the best, um, uh, you know, uh, so it, it, uh, maybe you should, uh, you should answer, but it, it was about uh, uh, nature being very parsimonious in its um, um, sort of design that we have very little flab and we are very little, we are, we are optimized for the goal that we are supposed, supposed to be doing um, such that there was a quote that, for, it was Leonardo da Vinci's quote was that saying that um, it's very hard to build a machine that is better than nature's version of what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. We may be able to build something which is very specialized and does something much better than uh, a human does at a very particular job, uh, but it's, it's a very good inspiration to have to look up to biometric systems. So having said that, uh, I don't think that humanoid robots necessarily uh, are the answer to all the, the problems that needs to be solved by robotics. So a lot of the examples here, it is humanoid robotics, humanoid robots, the form factor is like that because the kind of environment that these needs to operate in are actually built for humans. So there is a very good um, reason why robots um, so we've got very limited space on space shuttle missions and, and et cetera. So it's, it's a really hard thing to have a wheeled robot navigating the space because you would then have to separate some space for humans and some space for the robot. But having said that, a Robonaut is now there on the space station, Robonaut 2. Uh, it doesn't have any lower body. It attaches itself with the torso and has got long limbs, uh, non-anthropomorphic limbs, limbs which are almost snake-like to do certain kinds of operations. So I think it's horses for the courses in terms of saying you should think about other form factors, but humanoids are both exciting from a science fiction perspective, they are challenging because the problems you need to solve in terms of balance, form factor, drive the technology for other things, and at the same time, there are some domains where humanoids are still the best form factor. Thank you. So, so, so this was a Tam DL Prize lecture, so I'm now going to ask Tam to um, present the award. Sethu, your toys, uh, your words, not mine, don't come cheap. One of the th things that, in fact, the only thing that worries me about your talk is the huge expectations that will be raised among people who think that their medical problems are somehow going to be solved. Uh, Fifty years ago, uh, it was my privilege to represent uh, six coal mines and shale mines in this area. The nature of shale was that it was very brittle. And this inflicted all sorts of injuries that really could not be dealt with. And I have the vivid memory of a generation of miners 
stuck in their own homes, if only they had had some of the instruments that you've outlined us today, it would have been life-changing. What I would ask you, and I ask you to go to the platform to answer the question, is they're very expensive in the first place. Is there any hope that somehow or another, with the economies of scale, that the costs will be reduced and therefore can be sustained by the health service? I would invite you to answer okay. that question. Okay. Thank you for posing that question. I think, I think it's a very, very uh, relevant question. And I think this is something that we've been um, dealing with firsthand. So the prosthetic hand that you see here, it's manufactured by a company called ILIMP. The original cost price for the development um, made uh, it prohibitively expensive for the original sale. It was on the order of 20,000 um, pounds. But, but now, the price has come down due to, not just because the, uh, the components have become cheaper, but because there are people who believe that there is just cause to actually support the research that is underlying, the technology underlying that, um, the, the noble cause. So in many cases, the core cost of creating a, a solution doesn't come from the materials themselves, although that is a significant part, it comes from two drivers. It comes from the huge amount of research and development that goes underneath it. So in the end, it's a very expensive product because there's 10, 15, 20 years of work that goes um, to support it. Um, secondly, it's about the, I wouldn't call it the scale of economies, but actually the economy itself. Um, you saw recently when there was the outbreak uh, of Ebola uh, till um, it affected the Western world. There, was, there wasn't any real response. So I think, I think it is symptomatic of the fact that um, if people care enough about a problem, there will be governments, there will be people who have the resources to support things who would could sort of pull behind this to really bring down the cost of these uh, core scientific um, examples, core scientific um, questions that needs to be answered. And my personal belief is that the cost of the device itself is not going to be prohibitively high to support some solutions for the kind of problems that you've been talking about. Well, thank you for an interesting and convincing reply on an unforgettable lecture. Sato, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and on Tam's behalf, I'm going to hand to Cecil the award. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so just in the last couple of minutes, I'd just like to give a, a vote of thanks to Sethu for such a fantastic and wonderful talk, Sethu. You, you've shown us a real vision of shared autonomy between humans and robots. You've showed us how robots can learn to walk and how they can learn to drive, and how they can also help humans walk who perhaps have had stroke or other illnesses. The other thing you've shown us is how fantastic humans actually are and how difficult it is for robots to do even half the things that humans can do. I think one of the major things that's, that I've really learned from this, this talk has been about the societal and ethical challenges that robots and robot activity uh, poses to us. But throughout your enthusiasm for your discipline and, and the thoughtfulness with which you've approached uh, your discipline is, is, I think, obvious to everybody. So I think the discipline of robotics is in a very exciting and also a safe place in your hands. And thank you so much for giving up a Sunday evening and sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you.